Bill, Order. The government... Senator Thorpe, you'll be in continuation when debate resumes. Questions without notice. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. The government has blocked amendments to allow the Fair Work Commission to hear disputes arising specifically from the Morrison government's hiring credit scheme, claiming its unfair dismissal laws are enough. Can the minister confirm that no casual workers with less than 12 months' service are covered by the government's unfair dismissal protections? The minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me start by saying, and I thank Senator Ciccone for the question. Let me start by saying, of course, it is expected that the job maker hiring credit will support around 450,000 jobs for young people to move them back into employment Order. at a cost of four billion dollars. We know that uh, employers will be able to claim the job maker hiring credit for new jobs created over the 12-month period beginning on the 7th of October for up to 12 months for each job. The uh, credit itself is only available for additional jobs. Uh, employers can't reduce their current workforce either by dismissing employees or reducing their hours and to re-engage new workers performing the same work to receive the hiring credit. All employees have protections under existing industrial relations laws from unfair or unlawful dismissal, including non-genuine redundancies. Uh, the rules exposure draft explanatory material makes clear, and I quote, that the types of arrangements that would be prevented by the integrity provisions in the Act are varied, but would include arrangements where an employer artificially inflates their employee headcount on their payroll for a job maker period, for example, by terminating or reducing the hours of Senator an Watt, existing older on a employee. Point of order. Uh, on relevance, Mr. President, the question was actually very, very narrow. It was about whether casuals with less than 12 months service are covered by the government's unfair dismissal provisions, and the minister hasn't addressed that. Well, that the point the, is that they're excluded well, well, Senator from protection. Watt, please, I've allowed you to restate the second part. There was a preface there, and while the minister is talking about rules around that, I believe she is being directly relevant. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, to reiterate, I did say that all employees have protections under in existing industrial relations laws from unfair or unlawful dismissal, including non-genuine redundancies. I was saying before, Mr. President, uh, before uh, Senator Watt took a point of order, that the rules expo exposure draft explanatory material makes clear that the types of arrangements that would be prevented by the integrity provisions in the Act are varied but would include arrangements where an employer artificially inflates their employee headcount order. and or Senator payroll, Payne, payroll I have Senator for Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Uh, the question goes to the government's unfair dismissal protections, and the minister was asked to confirm that no casual employee with less than 12 months service was covered. Uh, and I would, on the basis of direct relevance, ask her to return to that point. Senator. Wong, that was the question at the end of a preamble. I think the minister, by talking about the, those relevant provisions of that of the particular act, is being directly relevant. Um, there's an opportunity to debate the merit of answers after question time. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. And I note, in relation to unfair dismissal, that as I understand it, uh, an eligible employee can make an unfair dismissal claim if they have been dismissed and consider Order. their dismissal unfair. It's unlikely to be a valid reason for dismissal if an employer dismisses an, as an employee Order. Payne, to engage a new individual has to expired. take— Senator Payne, do it. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Did the government explain to Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts that under the Morrison government's existing laws, casual employees with less than 12 months continuous service have no protection under unfair dismissal in the Fair Work Act? Did the government also explain that any worker, whether they are casual, part-time or full-time, employed by a small business who has worked for less than 12 months service also has no protection from unfair dismissal claims? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I am absolutely confident that senators who come to this Sen chamber to make Senator decisions Pratt. in voting on legislation make decisions based on their own views, their own perspectives, and the information that they have at hand, the information that is available through the committee process, through the parliamentary process, through the engagement with government process. And if those opposite wish to impugn the integrity of Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts, that is a matter for them, but that is not something the government is going to do. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. 
Did the government also explain to Senator Hanson and Roberts that they have now exposed more than a million workers to being sacked without recourse in the middle of the deepest recession in Australia in a century? Why is the government refusing to protect workers by making sure those with a job get to keep that job? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, I would reiterate what I said uh, in relation to Senator Ciccone's first supplementary question, and that is the manner in which senators come to this chamber and make the decisions they make about uh, how they vote, what they support and what they don't support. Uh, they engage in the full uh, repertoire of information that is available to them. They engage with government. I'm sure they engage with uh, those opposite uh, as well, although one would be not sure how productive that would be. But nevertheless, those processes are undertaken and senators make their own decisions. I don't impugn the integrity of senators. I don't impugn the integrity of senators who make their, their decisions based on the information before Order. them. I'm not going to impugn Senator Hanson. I'm not going to impugn Senator Roberts. If those opposite and Senator Order. Ciccone wish to do so, that is a matter for them. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you. Order on my left. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Burning Birmingham. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government's strong economic leadership is meeting the challenge of COVID-19, getting the economy back on track and Australians back into jobs? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President, and, uh, and I thank Senator Smith for, uh, for his question and his very important question, because indeed Australia is leading the world when it comes to the economic recovery from the COVID-induced recession that the globe is facing. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on Australia, as it has had on countries right across the world. Our economy, as we know, contracted by 7 per cent in the June quarter. But this was substantially less, a much better performance than many of our international peers. In the UK, it contracted by more than 20 per cent in Canada by more than 11 per cent, in the United States by more than 9 per cent. It was the decisive action that our government was able to take, thanks to years of good economic management, that enabled us to respond so strongly. And we're now seeing our economy recover well as well. Our economic recovery plan is working. It's a long journey to come back from a hit this big, but 450,000 jobs have been recreated in the last four months. More than half of the record number of jobs lost from the COVID-19 crisis have already been recovered. Yesterday, we saw the Consumer Sentiment Index has risen again for the third straight month. In fact, Consumer Sentiment last month had its single biggest rise in a budget month since the series was created in 1974. We also saw the Consumer Confidence Index up for the 10th consecutive week, and it's now hit an eight-month high. Business confidence is up as well, Mr President. It's up for trade, it's up for transport, up in construction and up in mining. We're seeing there, Mr President, the Australian economy recover because of the type of policy measures our government put in place to get business through the pandemic and to help them out of the pandemic. JobKeeper has seen $70 billion of support flow, but our other measures in this budget Order, are Senator now Birmingham. about helping Time that growth the agenda. Time has expired. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government's job maker hiring credit will support Australia's economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the job maker hiring credit is an important part of our budget. Our budget outlined incentives to be able to help businesses be encouraged to invest more to ensure that they could carry back losses, to be able to recognise those under financial pressure this year, to ensure they can invest and deduct, to incentivise the bringing forward of economic activity. And yes, the hiring credit helps them to en and encourages them to employ more young Australians. We have done the research about what the impact has been in previous recessions, and we know that youth unemployment took the longest to recover from previous recessions. We know when we look at the old New Start data as well, that where young Australians get stuck on unemployment for too long, it is so much harder to get them off of those unemployment benefits. That's why 
The job maker hiring credit was, is being put in place to provide that incentive to make sure we don't have undue numbers of young Australians stuck on the unemployment queues any longer than is necessary. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain how the Morrison government is playing a leadership role on the global economic recovery from the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, although it is a long and hard road back from a hit the size of this, we are working to share our experiences with the rest of the world. The Prime Minister and other ministers have been actively engaged throughout this time in seeking knowledge and lessons from other parts of the world, but also in sharing our experience in successfully suppressing the spread of COVID-19, our experience in securing employment and jobs and businesses wherever we can through the type of responses we've put in place. The Prime Minister is preparing to participate in the Australia ASEAN Summit, the East Asia Summit and the APEC Leaders Summit, as well as the G20 Summit over the course of the next weekend. We're playing a leading role in WTO negotiations as well in areas of fisheries subsidies to ensure the sustainable future of our oceans, as well as on e-commerce, where we negotiate the first set of global rules on digital trade, so important, ever more important, as we've seen the way economies and businesses pivoted during this pandemic. It's our leadership that has helped get Australia through, and Order. we are working Senator constructively Birmingham. with the world Senator too. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. A former Liberal staffer who worked for the Minister in a senior capacity asserts in a complaint made to the Department of Finance that she faced bullying and gaslighting in the Minister's office due to her relationship with Minister Tudge. She said, and I quote, during this time the Minister was also posting text messages on the office WhatsApp group that I felt were attacking and demeaning towards myself. Is this true? The Minister for um, Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, in response to your question, no, it is not. Uh, a more fulsome answer is this. I completely reject the allegations that this employee, Ms Rochelle Miller, has made against me and my former Chief of Staff that were reported in two media outlets today. During the time of her employment, between late 2017 and mid-2018, Ms Miller was provided with support, leave and flexible work arrangements to accommodate her own personal circumstances. In fact, in the ABC article today, Ms Miller herself is quoted as saying, due to the persistent rumours across the building during my first week in the office, I confidentially let Minister Cash know that I was in a relationship with Alan that was now over and that my loyalty was to her. She was supportive and kind. But, Mr President, I am also particularly disappointed with the potentially defamatory allegations published by the ABC, which are false, and made against my former Chief of Staff who, now being a private citizen, was not even given a chance by the ABC to respond to the story before it was published. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When did the minister first become aware of the official complaint and the conduct to which it relates? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, it won't be of surprise to many. I was made aware of the complaint when a journalist contacted my office yesterday. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. The complainant has said that she was bullied by the minister's chief of staff. Is this the same chief of staff that was under investigation by the AFP uh, for illegally leaking to the media and confirmed to be the source of the illegal leak, or was it another one? Senator Cash. Uh, this was not that same Chief of Staff, and I will again confirm on behalf of the Chief of Staff, against which the allegations have been made, I am particularly disappointed with the potentially defamatory allegations published by the ABC, which are false and made against my former Chief of Staff, who, as I said, despite now being a private citizen, was not even given a chance to respond to the story before it was published. Order. Senator Rice. 
Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Minister Payne. We know from US President-elect Biden's report of this morning's phone call between the President-elect and the Prime Minister that the discussion included confronting climate change. And interestingly, that the report of the equivalent conversation with the Japanese Prime Minister noted their shared commitment to tackle climate change. We also know that the Prime Minister tried to cut the climate crisis out of reports of his conversation with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So I'd like to get some things on the table now. How did climate feature in the conversation the Prime Minister had with President-elect Biden? And did they discuss how Australia's 2030 targets lag the rest of the world, contrasting starkly with President-elect Biden's commitment to zero carbon electricity by 2035? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Rice uh, for her question. I've seen uh, the readout of uh, the President-elect's uh, call with, uh, with Prime Minister Morrison. Uh, I think it is important to reinforce, uh, and I notice, of course, Senator Rice did not refer to this, but uh, both uh, leaders, uh, President-elect Biden and the Prime Minister, made clear our strong commitment to strengthening our alliance even further as we head towards the 70th anniversary of ANZUS next year. We agreed that there was no more critical time for our alliance as we face the global pandemic and we face a much more uncertain strategic environment. Point Pro of order. Senator Rice on a point of order. Point of order, Mr President. I'd ask you to draw the minister's attention to the topic of my question, which was specifically about how climate change was addressed in the conversation with President-elect Biden. Uh, on, on the point of order, um, it referenced the phone call as well, so I think for part of the answer, the minister is entitled to address the phone call as well. Um, following you, you have requested me, I'm sure the minister is aware of the second part of the question. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. As I was saying, and I think I had just said uh, with they, the leaders discussed their shared values and many shared interests, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. They also discussed the need for like-minded liberal democracies to do more together, which I'm sure would be endorsed by Senator Rice and uh, those uh, in her party, whether it is in the G7+, Plus, the Quad, the G20, through the leadership of multilateral institutions. Uh, the Prime Minister Morrison has also indicated that uh, their discussion included addressing global environmental challenges, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions and plastics pollution in the oceans. The Prime Minister welcomed President-elect Biden's commitment that the United States would rejoin the Paris Agreement, which, uh, as I would note, uh, Mr President, Australia has been a continuing and committed member of the agreement. They also discussed the alignment between the uh, president-elect's uh, climate change platform and Australia's focus on practical measures to reduce emissions through investment uh, in clean technology and to explore opportunities for partnerships on clean technology investment and deployment. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Vice President-elect Joe Biden has described the climate crisis as the number one issue facing humanity. Will Australia be represented at the climate summit President-elect Biden has pledged to hold within the first 100 days of his presidency? And I'll also invite the minister to actually respond to the point in my first question as whether they discussed 2030 targets in their phone call. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I've indicated what matters were discussed in the phone call, and I indicated across five points, I think, Mr President, what they were. Uh, it is a matter for President-elect Biden and the administration, once it is formed, uh, as to how they convene uh, that meeting. There are a number of other meetings. President-elect Biden, President Biden has indicated he wishes to, uh, to convene, uh, and Australia would welcome an opportunity to participate. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. At the COP26 conference in Glasgow next year, the US is certain to submit a more ambitious target than us for 2030, having already committed to the same target as us—26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels—five years earlier than us by 2025. And furthermore, European countries have already committed to increasing their ambition to 55 per cent between 1990 pollution levels by 2030. Will the government commit to stronger, more ambitious 2030 targets ahead of COP26? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Rice for her uh, supplementary question. The Australian government intends to communicate our long-term emissions reduction strategy before COP26. The Paris Agreement encourages parties to strive 
to formulate and communicate long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. It does not, uh, as it stands, require us to submit a long-term emissions reduction target. This government has released the Technology Investment Roadmap's first annual Low Emissions Technology Statement, setting out stretch goals for key technologies to underpin the transmission to a low emissions economy. These goals will be reviewed annually and with the flexibility of adding new technologies as appropriate. Australia's Paris target to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent on 2005 levels by 2030 is a responsible and ambitious con contribution to global climate action. It is ambitious because it represents a halving of emissions per person in Australia and a two-thirds reduction in emissions per unit of GDP. Those reductions, Mr President, are amongst the highest of G20 countries. Or Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. The Minister will be aware that Northern Endeavour, a floating uh, production storage and offloading vessel, is sitting off the coast of Darwin in lighthouse mode after the government forced the operator into liquidation. Nopsema's refusal to direct the company as to what safety issues needed to be addressed uh, to get the vessel back into production, a criticism levelled at the government in the Walker Review, is now costing the taxpayer $1 million per, per week. That's, uh, that's 34 ICU beds per week. According to evidence provided estimates, the government has spent more than $60 million thus far. By my estimation, the government is going to shortly run out of the offensive $76 million budgeted to deal with this. Have you got enough money in the budget to deal with this blunder? How much is, is the total cost to the taxpayer going to be? And what is the plan to deal with the government, this government-induced money slick leaking from the vessel? Order. So, the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for your question, uh, and also acknowledge some advance notice about the, the subject and the topic that you are wishing to ask me on. Can I firstly say that it is the absolute priority of this government, firstly, to ensure the safety of any crew on any of these types of vessels, but also the protection of the marine environment. And so, when putting in place um, uh, breaches in relation to safety. This government does not shy away from making sure that the absolute priority remains those two priorities that I laid out. Uh, but the government also um, has been very clear and very transparent about the process that it has put around, making sure that we put the protections in place uh, to make sure that, that we have safety of individuals and the protection of the environment. Um, as you would know, um, Senator Patrick, um, the Commonwealth has contracted UPS. Um, to ensure the safe operations on board the Northern Endera and to undertake the critical works while planning on a permanent solution for this particular issue, uh, the facility and the field in which it is currently operating. Um, we've also ensured that the necessary insurances are in place the oil and the oil spill uh, memberships are in place. And this includes memberships with the Australian Marit uh, Marine Oil Spill Centre, Oil Spill Response Limited and Lord's Ship Emergency Response Service. So, um, as part of developing a longer-term solution, we have been engaged with industry more broadly, understanding uh, that this is a matter that needs to be undertaken, um, engaging everybody, but also to make sure um, that the commercial viability of restarting such a, a program, as well as the requirements of the complete decommissioning uh, or remediation project that are associated with working, uh, making sure this project uh, or this particular facility is, is safe to people and to the environment. Um, I can assure you that the government will apply whatever resources are necessary to ensure the safety of the crew and to protect the marine environment. Mm -hmm. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Minister, what, what happened to Northern Endeavour could well happen to some of ExxonMobil's assets in the Bass Strait, which it is trying to offload. ExxonMobil has earned $42 billion in revenue over the past five tax transparency years and not paid a brass razu in tax and would appear to be seeking to devolve themselves of responsibilities for the assets that were used to generate this tax-free revenue. The cost of the taxpayer could be billions. What is the government doing to prevent this from happening? Senator Rustin. Well, um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. The government takes very seriously its responsibilities about the absolute responsible um, stewardship of, uh, of the Australian taxpayer resources and also operating in a manner that is in the best interests of Australia. 
but in doing so, we also make sure that the security and safety of Australians and our marine environment or our terrestrial environment is absolutely of the utmost importance to us at all as well. But, um, Senator Patrick, in relation to the specifics um, around um, particular, um, particular issues that um, I wasn't aware that you were asking about, I'm more than happy to take on notice. But in an overarching way, I would absolutely commit to you that all of the behaviour of the, the government, of which I am a member, in relation to protecting the interests of Australians when it comes to the sovereignty of our country, the protecting of the resources that belong to all Australians, uh, that is something that we take extraordinarily seriously and will continue to make sure, through the appropriate independent regulation and oversight, that they are well looked after. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In October last year, at estimates, I foreshadowed this bungle. I asked Nopsema. What happens if they go into liquidation, so the ha asset has to be sold off or the company is not able to operate? The taxpayer now bears the cost. That's ultimately what's, uh, what is going on. To which the response from Mr Smith of Nopsema was, we won't be taking over anything. That's not our role. And yet here we are, uh, the owners of an FPSO and a $300 million bungle. Who got fired, Minister? Who is being held accountable for this? Senator Rustin. Uh, well, there are a number of things I'd say in response to that question. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and from Senator Patrick. First of all, nothing in, in the operation in the commercial world is without risk. But of course, the government does whatever it can to mitigate against that risk and to minimise that risk. And that is why the role of NOPSEMA um, is so important because of their independence around um, safety of the and the environment uh, and uh, the oversight that they uh, that they undertake. Um, it's certainly the role, the role that you just suggested that NOPSEMA should have been undertaking is not their role. They are the safety uh, and environmental um, oversight body. But certainly, um, it is, as I said, it's absolutely essential when we're dealing um, you know, with any, any um, commercial activities that are re redeeming the assets of the Australian public, um, such as in the oil and gas area, that we understand their risks and we operate to mitigate against those risks. Um, but I certainly can absolutely guarantee this chamber that the safety of the Australian public, Order. workers Senator on Rustin, vessels and our environment the has is expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on recent developments in Hong Kong? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson for his question. Mr. President, Beijing has this week disqualified four duly elected Legislative Council lawmakers. On the 11th of November, the 23rd meeting of the Standing Committee of the 13th National People's Congress in Beijing agreed to a resolution that outlines disqualification criteria for members of the Legislative Council, including an unspecific reference to endangering national security. It is the view of the Australian government that the disqualification of candidates to members severely undermines Hong Kong's democratic processes and institutions, as well as the high degree of autonomy set out in the Basic Law and the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Australia has issued a statement. Australia calls on authorities to allow the Legislative Council to fulfil its role as the primary forum for popular political expression in Hong Kong, to remain a key pillar of the rule of law and the one country, two systems framework. We urge the Chinese government and Hong Kong authorities to uphold their long-standing commitments and international legal obligations. This is critical to maintaining international confidence in Hong Kong. This latest measure follows earlier developments that have also concerned Australia and many other nations. It continues an approach that steadily erodes the rights of the people of Hong Kong. Australia and the international community will maintain a consistent focus on human rights and principles of freedom, of transparency, of autonomy and the rule of law and will continue to monitor developments in this matter closely. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. Can the Minister advise the Senate how Australia is working with our international partners on these issues? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Australia and partners, multiple partners, have made a number of joint statements on concerning developments in Hong Kong, including previously with Canada, with New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States. We have also done so with partners in the UN Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly. 
These have included the imposition of the national security law, the disqualification of legislative council candidates and postponement of elections, uh, and the violence during pro-democracy protests last year and early this year, including by Hong Kong authorities. The importance of continuing to monitor, to speak in defence of, rights and freedoms of people in Hong Kong is an ongoing focus for the Australian government. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister explain the importance of continuing autonomy and a higher degree of freedoms in Hong Kong? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. The international community has a very long-standing interest in Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. Australia itself has a substantial stake in Hong Kong's success. The city is home to our largest commercial presence in Asia and our biggest uh, expatriate community globally. Beijing committed to autonomy and freedoms to the Hong Kong people under the one country, two systems principle set out in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. This is a legally binding United Nations registered treaty. It also provides that rights and freedoms, including those of the person, of the press, of assembly, of association and others, will be guaranteed by law in Hong Kong. As I said in response to Senator Patterson's per first question, Australia and the international community will maintain a consistent focus on human rights and principles of freedom, autonomy, transparency Order. and Senator the rule Payne. of law. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Leave granted. Uh, I, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I, I simply wish to take this opportunity to associate the opposition with the statements made by the foreign minister in that answer, and to express our continued bipartisan support for the principles and the concerns raised in relation to Hong Kong. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. In Senate estimates this week, it was revealed that the ABC managing director received half a dozen emails as well as phone calls from staff of government ministers questioning the airing of the Four Corners program inside the Canberra bubble. It was also revealed that other ABC staff and the ABC board were contacted by government representatives about the program. Who contacted the ABC board and management? When did the Prime Minister or his office first become aware that ministerial staff had contacted ABC board and management about the Four Corners program? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I'm afraid I'm not aware of those details. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Perhaps in this question the Minister could take those answers on notice. Uh, Senators Stoker Order. and Henderson asked a series of questions at Senate Estimates designed to undermine the legitimacy of the Four Corners report and the ABC. Can the minister Order. guarantee that no member of the Prime Minister's office or any other minister's offices On directed right. or assisted Senators Stoker and Henderson? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, that is quite a remarkable allegation that, uh, that Senator Watt comes in here, seeking to cast judgment Order. on questions being asked by senators. Seeking to cast judgment or impugn the motives of questions being asked at Senate estimates by other senators. And of all the people, I mean of all the people to seek to judge when it comes to Senate estimates behaviour, we're not going to take any lectures from Senator Watt. We're not going to be taking lectures about Order. standards of conduct in Senate estimates from Senator Order. Watt. Order. Senator, on my right, I'll call Senator Watt when I can hear him. Order, Senator, Senator Watt. On relevance, the question was simply whether other ministers assisted Senator Stoker or Henderson and or whether Senator, they were freelancing. Senator Watt, you know the question had a lot more than that in it. And I might say um, I will ask people to carefully ref re reflect on the wording of questions when imp imp imputing motives to other senators asking questions as opposed to attributing it to a potential effect of asking questions. I didn't call you, I didn't call you up on that, but I think that came perilously close to imputing a motive to the actions of another senator in performing their duties as a senator. Now there was a lot in that question and the minister is more than directly relevant in responding. Senator Birmingham. Thanks Mr President. Now I would be very surprised if Senator Watt 
who asks a lot of Senator Estimates questions, and, and good on him for doing so, but I'd be very surprised if he's never had a conversation with his leader or his leader's office or other shadow ministers or other colleagues or people outside of this building. Senators come and ask questions Order. in Senate Senator Estimates Senator all Birmingham, of the time. time for the answer has expired. Senator what a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The ABC managing director took on notice a question to table the emails that were sent to the ABC by government representatives in relation to the Four Corners program. Can the minister guarantee there has been no intimidation of ABC staff or threats to the ABC or its funding by the government in relation to this program? Senator Birmingham. Mr. 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 President. Mr. President. Order. The ABC's charter rights are all set in law. Its budget is laid out firmly in the budget according to the triennial funding obligations. Um, the minister has concluded his answer. Senator Wong. No guarantee of no intimidation. Order. Senator Wong. No I can't, I, of no intimidation. I, I, Senator, Senator Wong. I, yes, I can't, it's a point of order. Um, there, there, there can't be a point of order. Senator Wong, please. Senator Wong. Senator, Senator Wong, please. Order. Sen Senators Watt and Wong and Rennick. Senator Chandler is on her feet. She is going to have the call. Senator Wong, please. I've asked you several times, and I've I asked Senator Rennick too, but I was calling you before he started interjecting. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government's leadership in response to COVID-19 is supporting Australians who have been hardest hit by the economic consequences of the pandemic? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Chandler for her question? Um, the Morrison government is absolutely focused on supporting all Australians as we fight our way through this uh, incredible pandemic as we open the economy. Over the course of this year, the government has provided leadership and support to the community. We have tried to cushion the blow from the pandemic with enormous fiscal and economic support through programs such as the JobKeeper program, the Job Maker program in the budget and enhanced measures across the income support system. This week, the Prime Minister and I announced that we will extend temporarily the enhanced support through the social security system for a further three months as economic confidence builds and momentum builds across the economy. We are spending $3.2 billion in the first three months of next year uh, to extend the supplement from 1 January to 31 March. But importantly, our extended temporary measures go much, much further than just the supplement. For an additional three months, we will be expanding uh, the eligibility for these payments. These measures will enable about 185,000 people to access payment during these uncertain and challenging times who otherwise would not be eligible for payment. And that includes such things as the extension of the partner income taper test so that people will be able to access uh, some uh, payments where their partner earns less than $80,000 a year. We will also be extending eligibility to people like sole traders, people who are self-employed, people who have been stood down, people who are having to isolate and people who are looking after somebody who has had to isolate as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we will also extend the nil rate period, which basically means people will be able to retain um, their concession cards as they return to the workforce to provide additional confidence and security and certainty to them as they make that very, very important transition back to work. Through these extensions, the new measures like the one-off payment to pensioners we will stand side by side with all Australians as Order. we recover Senator from the Russell. pandemic. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the government managing Australia's comprehensive and well-targeted social security system to encourage people back into the workforce? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as we extend additional and temporary supports, we also need to make sure that we strike the right balance between providing elevated levels of support to people but also providing incentives for people to re-engage with the workforce. And that's why in September we have temporarily increased the income-free area of the job seeker payment and youth allowance other payment uh, to allow people to earn up to $300 per fortnight. That means that recipients can earn that $300 a fortnight without losing a cent of their payment. 
So we're extending this measure for another three months from the 1st of January because we want to make sure that people have the confidence to go back and test themselves, just put their toe in the water in the job market, even if it is only for a day a week. And we know through our priority, priority investment approach that people who report earnings, even if they're only a small amount of earnings, are twice as likely to come off payment uh, than those people who do not report earnings. This is absolutely essential as we help people to re-engage with the workforce as our economy opens and people can go back Senator to work. Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the government's economic recovery plan is generating positive signs for our economic recovery? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, it is really pleasing to be able to tell the Senate that the economic outlook is improving. I mean, just last week, the, uh, the Reserve Bank confirmed that the economic recovery in Australia is well underway, and they upgraded their forecasts around the Australian economic growth and for our labour market. I mean, pleasingly, 450,000 jobs have been created in the last four months, uh, with more than half of the record number of jobs lost having already now been recovered. And the RBA expects that further in, in our, uh, easing in the domestic um, activity around restrictions, particularly in Victoria, uh, is going to see um, a boost to employment over the coming months. Um, the ANZ Australian job advertisements rose 9.4 per cent in October, uh, following an 8.3 per cent increase in September. And we've now regained more than three quarters of the fall uh, that we saw between March and April. The ABS data is also showing significant uh, growth and improvement in job vacancies being reported. Consumer confidence is up. Order, and Senator Rustin. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The Job Seeker Coronavirus Supplement payment was $550 per fortnight, which the government then reduced in September to $250 a fortnight. Can the minister confirm this represents a $300 reduction per fortnight? Senator, the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Polly for her question and her persistence in this particular issue. Senator Polly, I have to say that no matter how you look at an increase in the budget, an increase in the, the amount of spending that is being put Order. into a particular— Senator, Senator, I, I'm going to take Senator Polly's point of order when I can hear her. Um, if your colleagues would stop interjecting, I'll take your point of order. Senator Polly. My point of order is it was a very direct question to the minister. Has there been and yeah. does it mean that there's been a $300 um, a fortnight I, I, reduction? I appreciate the. Um, can I make a ruling before you take it? Okay. Um, I appreciate the um, point you are trying to make. In my view, I cannot put words into a minister's mouth nor instruct them on the terms on how to answer a question. If the minister is talking about the very supplement and the very amount and challenging an assumption in the question, I view that as directly relevant. It is very narrow, and so the answer must deal with this particular payment supplement, in my view, to be directly relevant. Senator Wong. Uh, well, on the point of order, uh, Mr President, uh, and may I, may I ask you to reconsider the ruling you just made? because. In my submission, uh, that really does undermine the basis of that standing order and previous rulings. There is a very direct question which goes to whether or not 550 less 250 represents $300 reduction per fortnight. Uh, and just because, just because there's a reference uh, in the minister's answer to the payment, uh, the name of the payment does not make it directly relevant to the question. Uh, my submission goes to actually ensuring that this question time operates as a forum for ministerial accountability rather than as an opportunity for people to pretend black is white. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, on the point of order, Mr President, it is essential for a minister to be able to contest or question the validity, the elements or otherwise of a question in their response to that question. A question cannot simply be presented in a manner that expects a black or white response. That is why we have a period of time for ministers to respond in question time. Uh, Mr President, your approach has been a consistent one 
that yes, the narrower the question, the narrower the scope for the response. But certainly, where a question relates to a particular payment, where a question relates to a particular payment, then there has to be an opportunity for a minister to reflect on all of the elements of that payment, not just not just respond to the narrow proposition that the opposition may want. So, I will restate what I have said before on this matter. In my view, to be directly relevant means that an answer must directly refer to or address, including challenging material or assertions contained in a question. There was no preamble for this question. I accept that. I did not say, and I reject any assertion that I said a minister only had to mention the payment. As long as the minister is talking about the payment and only the payment and the supplement that was asked about in that question and not ranging across other matters. Not a the point, Senator Wong, is that this minister has to directly address the topic raised. It is not appropriate, it is not appropriate for the chair to try and insert words into Senator Wong, if I could be honest, Senator Wong, I will continue to make my ruling and I will take as many submissions as, as, as um, senators want, but I haven't finished making my point yet. I did not say that the minister only had to mention the name of the payment. I said previously the minister had to be talking directly about the payment. Now, that was a very specific question. I made the point there is no preamble. I have allowed you to remind the minister of the question, and I have made it clear that I am going to strictly apply the test of direct relevance so that the minister must talk about that payment or supplement, as the case may be, in your question. But I cannot instruct her as to a manner or fashion of answering it. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and look, for, for the, as much as you might like to come in here and try and make me say something for some sort of social media grab that you want me to do, Senator Polly, I'm not going to do that. But what I will do is I'm more than happy to stand in here for hours and hours and hours and talk to the chamber about the, math, the provisions that we have put in place as a government, $507 billion of them, to support the Australian people and the Australian economy. But Senator Wong, on the point of order. Direct relevance. I ask that you might remind this minister of the question. Um, on that point, Senator Rustin, um, the question was specific in nature. It does not provide an opportunity to range across other activities of the government in dealing with this particular crisis. I made my point earlier. Your answer to be directly relevant to a specific question must be about this particular payment. That is my test on direct relevance um, and not other activities or a more wide-ranging um, uh, answer about policy. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And, and equally, I'm more than happy to be talking about the coronavirus supplement, which is the matter on which Senator Polly's question um, was prim primarily based on. Um, but what I would like to specifically say, well, the only thing that the Senator Polly's question was based on, uh, and what I would like to say, um, Mr President, is that the government put in place the coronavirus supplement, which is a supplement on top of the job seeker payment, to support Australians through this crisis. In September, after the extension, the, the, the coronavirus supplement expired, as per the legislation that was voted on by everybody in this chamber, you all voted for it to, to, to go to the 25th of September. Order. On the 20th of September, it expired. On the 25th of September, we put in an extension. And equally, this week we have announced that as of the 1st of January 2021, we will be continuing to extend that payment in conjunction with the job seeker payment for another three months. But as I explained to you yesterday, it is part of a suite of measures that we have put in place to help Australians. But if you'd like me to just talk about the coronavirus supplement, it is something that we put in place. We recognise the job market remains shallow, and that's why we have chosen to extend the payment from the 1st of January, just like we extended the payment Order, on the 25th Senator of Rustin. September. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, the government announced that the Job Seeker fortnightly supplement would go from $250 per fortnight to $150 per fortnight from the 1st of January. Can the minister confirm this? reduction represents $100 less a fortnight, and I am being persistent. Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Senator Polly, yes, you are being persistent. Um, but Senator Polly, um, it, at the risk of actually repeating my answer to the previous question, um, I categorically um, will put on the record for as many times as you ask this question, the government has on two occasions extended the coronavirus supplement as a part of the job seeker payment. And to come in here and suggest that an additional $3.2 billion, which the extension of the coronavirus supplement between the 1st of January and the 31st of March, will actually deliver straight into the pockets of Australians in that three-month period, $3.2 billion, you cannot possibly you cannot possibly categorize the expenditure of 3.2 billion dollars as a cut now senator polly i absolutely cannot understand how you cannot actually accept the fact 3.2 billion dollars of expenditure is actually order an senator increase. rustin senator polly a final supplementary question instead of playing word games minister why can't you be honest about the impact of your decision on struggling Australians. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Polly, for giving me some latitude to talk about the impact on Australians. We have stood side by side with Australians who have been impacted by the coronavirus, side by side, providing them with support to help them through this crisis. Not just in my portfolio area, particularly in Minister Cash's portfolio with small business, in the Treasurer's portfolio with the JobKeeper payment, across just about every portfolio area. I mean, Senator Payne, we've been supporting our neighbours in the in the region, here, in the Pacific, here. helping them. Senator, uh, Senator Reynolds, in terms of defence, making sure that defence personnel have been helping us through the crisis. Yeah. To come in here and suggest that we have not been helping Australians, standing side by side with Australians, helping through this pandemic, I have to say is nothing more than abject rubbish. Senator Polly. But what I would say is we will continue to stand by Australians by providing them with the health, the welfare support that they need to get through this pandemic, and we don't shy about it no matter how much Order, you Senator must Senator Rustin, time questions. for the answer has expired. Order. 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 Senators Rustin and Wong. Order. Senator. Order, Senator Rennick. Senator Canavan. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. President. Um, and my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development, Senator Cash. In my home state of Queensland, our agricultural industries contribute more than $12 billion to the economy. Without investment, though, in water security, we risk the future of agriculture in the regions at a time that we're already navigating the economic impacts of COVID. Can the minister advise the Senate how the Morrison McCormack government's plan to build dams across Australia is providing leadership on water security issues for rural and regional Australians? The minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Canavan for his question and acknowledge his passion for his home state of Queensland, but also for Northern Australia. And Senator Canavan, as you would know, the Liberal National Government is getting on with the job of building new water infrastructure to meet the needs of regional Australia, but to also help, Mr President, make our regions stronger. As Senator, Can Senator Canavan had said to me earlier, Whilst we are grateful for the recent rains, uh, we need to ensure the security supply and quality of our water. That is absolutely central to the future of regional Australia, but it is also Mr. President, central to the economic growth for all Australians. Uh, senators will be pleased to know that in the recent budget the government announced an additional $2 billion in grant funding under the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund. Mr President, this now brings the total commitment of the government to $3.5 billion to build dams, weirs and pipelines. And in fact, this additional investment, Senator Canavan, as you know, it supports the government's commitment to a rolling 10-year water infrastructure investment program. Mr President, the government has also now committed $1.5 billion through the fund to co-fund the construction of more than 20 
water infrastructure projects, with a total construction value, colleagues, of $2.7 billion. And Senator Canavan, you will be pleased to know that the Charleston Dam in far north Queensland, which I know you've been to far north Queensland on a regular basis, will now be finished in the coming weeks. And Mr President, unlike those on the other side, Senator Canavan does know where far north Queensland actually is. But a further 10 water projects have been contracted and are underway, and more than 50 feasibility projects have been undertaken Order. to assess their viability. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank the minister for that answer. And can the minister provide some more detail and an update on the progress of the Rookwood Weir project, a project that could double agricultural basin production Order. in the Fitzroy Basin? Order, Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, in Queensland, the Liberal National Government has an investment value of over. $516 million for 28 water infrastructure products and studies. In fact, as Senator Canavan has asked, the Rockwood Weir is a $352 million project and, Mr President, it will generate 200 jobs during construction on the Fitzroy River near Rockhampton. And, Mr President, in relation to the awarding of the contract, a local contractor was awarded the contract for the build. That is a great thing for that local contractor. And I understand that jobs for this fantastic build are actually being advertised as we speak. That is what this investment is all about, supporting these local contractors and Senator Canavan uh, creating those local jobs. And in fact, the projected water outcome, Senator Canavan, for Rookwood Weir is 50,000 megalitres of high reliability water. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, during the um, Queensland election campaign that just finished, uh, the Labor Party committed to apply to apply to the federal government for funds to build the Urana Dam. Is the minister aware of any approach by the Queensland Labor government in relation to the construction of the Urana Dam project? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, Senator Canavan, you may be aware that the Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, wrote to the state water ministers in September. And the Deputy Prime Minister asked them to bring forward their water infrastructure Order. priorities for consideration, Mr. President, by the National Order, Water Senator Grid Watt. Authority. Uh, Senator Canavan, I'm disappointed. I am disappointed to have to inform you that the Queensland Government has not yet brought forward projects, including the Urana Dam project, for consideration. Senator Canavan, just in case you didn't hear me, the Queensland Government has not yet brought forward projects including the Urana Dam project for consideration. But Senator Canavan, maybe they don't appreciate like you do the value. The value of the Urana um, Dam to Queensland. And Mr President, it is a huge business case. It suggests a water storage capacity up Order. to 1.1 million megalitres and 675 operational jobs. Order. Or on my left and right. Resist the temptation, Senator Watt, to fill the silence. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. A report from analytics consultancy Taylor Fry has found the reductions to job seeker and job keeper payments in late September had an, and I quote, instant and dramatic impact on the finances of Australian households. Why is the government withdrawing fiscal support from the economy and reducing income to Australian households when so many Australians are doing it tough? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I thank the senator for her question, um, uh, perhaps a repeat of the question I received from Senator Polly under a different guise. But, um, but uh, thank you very much for, for your question. And once again, um, I would reiterate that a decision taken by government, and this is, this is giving you a bit of a lecture about how budgets work, but a decision taken by government to increase the amount of funding that is available to the economy must only be considered as an increase. Now, for instance, in the budget there were $507 billion worth of measures that were included to support Australia in our, uh, as we come out of the COVID pandemic. 
Last week, well, actually, no, two days ago, the Prime Minister and I announced another $3.2 billion. There is, it would ends up that means that there is $510.2 billion, which means that's $3.2 billion more, Senator. So you cannot possibly say that it is not an increase in spending. But what I would say, Senator, is um, the really positive news and the reason why we have been in a position to be able to work with Australians to put the right balance in place between providing elevated levels of support, recognising, Senator, that the economy is still only in the early stages of recovery, the jobs market still does remain shallow, and that is why we made the decision to extend the supplement to support Australians. I mean, over the last four months, 450,000 jobs have been created. Of the 1.3 million jobs that were lost in the early stages of the pandemic, 750,000 of those have come back. We are seeing the economic recovery start. We are seeing positive moves in the jobs market, but we also understand that Australians do need continued elevated levels of support, and that's why the Prime Minister and I this week made the announcement to extend the, uh, the uh, coronavirus supplement for a further three months, along with all those other changes and enhancements that we will leave Order, in place Senator for those Rustin. three months. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. The report found the government's reductions in JobKeeper and JobSeeker will result in $4 billion less income in the pockets of 5 million Australians. Why is the government reducing households' abilities to spend and support jobs in the economy? Senator Rustin. Mm. Not quite sure how I answer this because clearly um, you don't understand the difference between an additional expenditure and when additional expenditure doesn't occur. I have told this chamber on so many occasions in the last two days that we have made an additional $3.2 billion available to Australians in the first three months of the next year. So I don't know how you can actually couch that in any other terms but additional funding. So you can't say you've cut something that was never there in the first place, Senator. There was never there in the first place. But what we have done is we've made the announcement that we are going to extend the supplement, extend the supplement, and that is $3.2 billion over three months. But you know, I, it is really important that we let Australians know that the economy is starting to recover. It is starting to open up. Jobs are being created. And in fact, the Reserve Bank said that the measures that have been put in place by this government have actually Order, been part Senator of the reason Rustin, we're recovering. Uh, Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. The government's own figures say that 1.8 million Australians will be relying on JobSeeker in December. Why does the minister think unemployment payments should be going down when people's costs have stayed the same? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, and at the risk of repeating myself for the 456th time today, I mean, I might call a point of order on myself for repetition. Um, but the fact is, Senator, that the the economy is starting to open up. We are starting to see jobs come back. Our job figures are showing that there are more jobs are being advertised, more jobs are being created, and more people are able to go back to work. In fact, we saw in, uh, in the May figures that we had 1.6 million people on payment, and at the end of October we see 1.5 million people on payment. Now that is way too many people on payment, and we don't shy away from that, which is why we've extended the supplement to help those people uh, through what is a tough time. But most particularly, we want to help them in their pathway back to employment, and that is why yeah, yeah. the supplement yeah, yeah. remains in place. But we do need to balance the difference between making sure that there's elevated levels of support to help those people, but at the same time we want to put the incentives in place because it's our job to help people back to work. Yeah, yeah. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on yeah, notice. Yeah. And in doing so, can I just acknowledge up in the gallery the presence of Senator Rustin's mum, Joy, who's travelled from Renmark to be with us. Welcome, Joy. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers made by the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations today, uh, Senator Order. Payne, in relation to uh, my question on the job maker hiring credits. Earlier in question time, Senator Payne was asked to confirm that casual workers with less than 12 months continuity are not covered 
by the unfair dismissal protections under the Fair Work Act. Senator Payne was asked to confirm also whether or not One Nation senators in this place were advised that casuals with less than 12 months' employment are not covered by unfair dismissal protections. The minister was asked to explain to the Senate and through it to explain to the Australian people why they are leaving casual workers exposed and vulnerable to unfair dismissal in favour of workers who are eligible for the hiring credit. Unfortunately, what we got from the minister today was an absolute zero answer to our questions. And that's not a surprise. After all, it is very clear that this government is all about an announcement and about no substance to when it provides answers to this place. Oh, sorry, Senator Canavan. Clock seems to be frozen at the moment. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's review a few facts about casual workers in Australia. Well, that's right, Just Senator. Just hang Farrell. on a moment, Senator Ciccone. Right now, go. Let's review a few facts about casual workers in Australia. And according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, there are just over 2.6 million casual workers before the pandemic had hit. And at 24 per cent, that's just under a quarter of all workers nationally, up from 19 per cent in the late uh, 1990s. And the work that is in retail, in trade, accommodation and food services, in construction, health, education and transport, industries that are absolutely crucial to ensure that our economy rebuilds post the pandemic. Again, in the data from the ABS, of those 2.6 million workers, one million of them had been with their employer for less than 12 months. Casual workers are more likely to be young and they're more likely to be women. And I know this, being a former union official with the SDA union, having represented these many millions of workers in retail, hospitality and warehouse as Senator Farrell would also know himself too, being a former official and national president indeed. The hiring credit leaves around a million casual workers unprotected from unfair dismissal and vulnerable to having their hours reduced or being let go. And this concern has been raised by Labor, by the union movement and a range of other stakeholder groups. And I guess the question is why? Why is it that when a relatively simple amendment why would the government not help protect a million of Australia's most vulnerable workers who are predominantly young and who are women? These workers were excluded from the JobKeeper program and now they are being excluded from the basic entitlements that other workers in this country get to enjoy. Madam Deputy President, casual workers deserve better. They deserve the respect of this government. They, do, they deserve the respect of every senator in this place. This government has exposed one million workers to the risk of being sacked without recourse in the middle of Australia's deepest recession, at a time when there are more than 100 people applying for every one job. Yet this government, if they were fair dinkum, they'd be truly respecting our workers and would support them. If this government truly respected workers as they claim, they would also include them in the basic unfair dismissal protections. After all, the government claims that they're working side by side with workers. Well, let's do it. Let's protect these workers. Let's protect all workers in this country and make that contribution back to our Australian economy. Because after all, we all want to see our economy rebuild and rebounds after what has been a pretty you know, unbelievable 12 months. Yet instead, casual workers will again be left behind by this coalition government. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Canavan. Uh, look, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Um, I know it's been a tough week for the, the opposition, a, a tough week when they've lost perhaps their only uh, voice of common sense uh, from their front bench. Uh, it's now a no Joel Labor Party uh, in place, a Joel Free Zone over there on the other side. And, and that means it's, of course, also a job free zone 
in the Labor Party as well. It's a, it's a job-free zone over there in the Labor Party because there was the only member of the Labor Party front bench that was actually sticking up for people's jobs, sticking up for the dignity of work, sticking up for the, a future Australia that could create uh, jobs in, in, in industries like mining and agriculture and stuff that, we, the, the stuff that is the bedrock of our nation. He's gone. He's gone. Uh, because he couldn't cop sticking around with a bunch of crazy lefties who hate those industries and want to see those jobs go. Uh, so he is out of the out of the tent, out of the tent. And is it any? Is it just a coincidence then? Is it just a coincidence that the week that, that Joel has left the coop, uh, it's the same week that we've seen all week the uh, Labor Party uh, opposed to and spent their question time on a program uh, being against a program called Job Maker. They've spent their whole week being against a program that is about making jobs uh, in the very week that the only bloke who wanted to make jobs has left their party. I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I, I, I think there's a bit of a ca ca causation here. It's not just correlation. There's a causation here that the one bloke who was up for defending jobs the Labor Party has gone, and now the Labor Party have spent their ta tactical time opposed to a program that is all about creating jobs for Australians. All about creating jobs. This program, the Job Maker program, is all about providing incentives for people to create new jobs, for businesses to put people on work. And what does the Labor Party do? They want to oppose it. They want to oppose providing incentives to employers for create, to create jobs because they're just not in favour of work. They're just not in favour of jobs. It's not their focus as a party. Certainly not one without Joel Fitzgibbon there at the front. Now, I think you know, that sometimes the Labor Party does like to talk about jobs. They do sometimes come out and say, oh, we want to support jobs. We want to support the hydrogen industry. Sometimes they come out and things like that. We're going to support hydrogen. There's going to be jobs in hydrogen. Well, Mr. Ma sorry, Madam Mackin, Deputy President, those jobs are fake jobs. They are fake jobs. There is no <coughs> large-scale hydrogen industry across the world. There is none likely to be for decades. But they get behind these industries and, and try and con workers in the mining sector, workers in power stations. They try and con them and say, oh, we might be, we'll be sacking you, but don't worry, there'll be these other jobs, these fake jobs in industries like, uh, like imaginary massive hydrogen exports that we'll never get to in, in any, any reasonable time frame. So they are against, Madam Mackey, President, the Labor Party is against the Job Maker program, but they're all for, they're all for a Job Faker program. That's their policies. Their policies over there are for a Job Faker program because they're all about supporting fake industries, fake jobs to try and con hardworking Australians out of their livelihoods, Mr. Madam Act Deputy President. Well, we won't do that here. We won't cop that here. We'll be defending and fighting for those jobs through programs like the Job Maker uh, Initiative. We'll be making sure that we fight for the rights of Australians to work, to have a job and have a livelihood. Now, on the specific issues that Senator Ciccone was raising, he was raising the fact that the unfair dismissal laws does not, do not have the same protections for those that are casuals for less than 12 months. Well, Mr. Madam Bixen, President, we haven't changed the unfair dismissal laws while we've been in government. They're the same provisions that were there when they were in government. They were in government. They, the last major changes to industrial relations legislation was under the Labor Party and the Labor government. And they set up those laws, Madam Deputy President, and they, they, they are what they are right now because they were ticked off by the Labor Party. There are, you cannot just be, uh, just be wantonly dismissed from your job, but yes, there are extra protections under the unfair dismissal laws for those in, who are in more permanent work. Those are the laws that were put there by the Labor Party. Now, Madam Deputy President, I think that uh, maybe uh, eventually the Labor Party will wake up to themselves here. Uh, uh, perhaps, hopefully, hopefully, for the goodness of our country and future of our nation, there will be a dropping of the rhetoric on the job faker program. There will be. You can see Joel setting himself up here. Maybe he's just the stalking horse. But there's a drumbeat here now. There's a drumbeat every day. Joel's doing a different thing today. He wants Senator to sack. Senator Canavan, may I remind you to refer to? Uh, those in the other place by their correct titles. Thank you. I will do that to Mr. Fitzgibbon. I think he'd much prefer to me refer to him as he, uh, uh, with his uh, uh, first name, but I will do that to Mr. Fitzgibbon. Mr. Fitzgibbon is lining up here. He is lining up here uh, uh, to cause destabilisation, to, to have a crack, maybe for himself, maybe for someone else, because the current leadership of the Labor Party are not defending jobs, they're not defending Australians, and they're probably going to be a change over there very soon. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Walsh. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, today we asked the government about its uh, absolutely grubby deal with One Nation, its grubby deal to strip workers of protections, uh, protections against being sacked and replaced by businesses uh, using the government's job maker hiring credit scheme. Uh, and there's a million workers out there today that got no answers from this government in question time today. Uh, no answers as to why they've teamed up with One Nation uh, to allow these workers to be replaced uh, in the middle of the worst recession in 100 years. Uh, and in blocking uh, our amendments, our sensible amendments uh, to this bill, the government and Pauline Hanson's One Nation has hung out over a million people who need support today. Older workers who can now be replaced by younger workers on the government's jobmaker hiring scheme. What Senators Hanson and Roberts have done uh, in this dirty deal with the government is hang out over a million workers in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, in the middle of the worst recession in 100 years. Uh, and they've absolutely hung them out uh, by refusing to support our amendments and given no answers to those workers today about exactly why they've chosen to do that, um, why they've chosen to ignore, while they, why they've chosen to, to vote down amendments that would have protected older workers from being unfairly dismissed. That's all they would have done, is protect older workers from being unfairly dismissed uh, in favour of younger workers who do attract this hiring subsidy, the government's hiring subsidy. So they've absolutely hung out older workers who have no access to unfair dismissal protections today. Uh, and it remains unclear as to whether Senators Hanson and Senator Roberts uh, understood what they were voting for, whether they understood that these workers have no access to unfair dismissal protections today. Uh, casuals with less than 12 months service have no access to unfair dismissal protections today. Uh, permanent workers, uh, casual workers, part-time workers with less than 12 months service in a small business, they have no protection from unfair dismissal today. Uh, and these are the workers who could be thrown on the scrap heap, who could be replaced if they're over 35 by the government's failure to support our amendments, by One Nation's failure to support our amendments and protect those workers from being replaced, protect those workers from being unfairly dismissed. These workers have been hung out. They've been hung out by the government. They've been hung out by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. They've been hung out in the middle of this recession. They've been hung out right at the time when the latest ABS figures show that 30,000 jobs were lost in the last reported fortnight uh, in every state and territory, across every state and territory. Uh, this is a deep uh, jobs crisis in this country. 470,000 jobs have been lost since the pandemic began. 160,000 people are projected to lose their jobs by Christmas. And so this is not the time for the government to be leaving people behind. This is not the time for the government to be leaving behind workers who are over 35. Uh, this is not the time for the government to be leaving behind older workers, older workers who could be replaced by younger workers, by younger workers on insecure jobs because of the government's dirty deal, their dirty dealings with Pauline Hanson's One Nation uh, in the Senate. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised that this has happened because this is a government that finds it all too easy to leave people behind, uh, to leave them behind in this pandemic and in this recession. Uh, because one second, uh, we're all in this together and the next if you're good at your job, you'll get a job, uh, and it's your fault if you're unemployed in the worst recession and the worst jobs crisis for almost 100 years. And at the beginning of this crisis, Scott Morrison told us their support programs would be equal, that they wouldn't leave the vulnerable behind. Um, well, that was one day, uh, and this week we've seen something different, where the government has teamed up with One Nation to leave older workers behind, to leave them behind in this job maker hiring credit, 
to fail to protect them from being sacked unfairly and being replaced with younger workers in insecure jobs who may attract this hiring credit. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And I'm not quite sure if the Labor Party has actually read the details of this job maker hiring credit scheme. Because there are protections in place, and it's very, very simple. It's not available to an employer if they don't increase the number of the headcount. So if you sack somebody, if you've got 20 people and you sack somebody and you re-employ re someone else, you've still only got 20 people. Okay, so you're not going to go and sack someone and then re-employ them because you won't get the credit scheme. <clears throat> the credit, sorry. So. For the last 24 hours, Labor have been running around you know, making personal smears against One Nation for voting for us. Pauline's got the intelligence to actually sit down and read the legislation. It wouldn't actually uh, do Labor any harm for a change to actually sit down and read legislation instead of making personal smears and endowenda across all their social media platforms. You know, maybe if they spent a little more time reading understanding and applying the law and less time with indoctrination and intimidation and smearing and making videos on social media, they would understand the legislation. Now, there's been points made in here today about how casuals aren't entitled to the same rights and privileges as other types of employees. That's because a lot of people actually choose that type of work so that they can have flexibility so that they can have flexibility. And let's, put in, let's look at it through the eyes of small business. Okay, a lot of small business uh, work and income is volatile. It's, it, it goes up, it goes down. They need the flexibility to be able to call staff when they need them and then not call staff when they don't need them. It's this type of rigidity that the Labor Party try and implement in their IR legislation, and it's in the fair work legislation, that gives no flexibility in the workplace for employers. You know, and you ask yourself why employers keep going offshore. It's because of these archaic fair work laws that have shown, ever since the Fair Work Act came in in 2009, the number of people on casual labour has increased because employers won't take on permanent or part-time staff because they know how difficult it is to navigate through the fair work system implemented by the Rudd-Gillard system. By the Rudd-Gillard system. Now, this measure is, for, is a $4 billion measure to help get people back to work. And it's worth pointing out that if it wasn't for Victoria and Daniel Andrews and his catastrophic uh, management of contact tracing and testing, We'd have probably had a lot of these people back to work by June or July instead of only coming out of it by now. I mean, we went into COVID in late March and we had got on top of it by late May. We could have contained this to two months. But no, 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 no. It's gone on now for over seven months. We've had 10 times the number of deaths what we would have had if we'd have fixed this problem in June and Dan, uh, the Victorian Premier had have actually managed the hotel quarantine, had to manage contact tracing, but no, because when Labor's in charge, you know it's going to be a mess. You know it's going to be a mess. So for the Labor Party to come in here and criticise this government, who has been one of the world's leading governments in, first of all, reducing uh, and getting on top of COVID, and in income support, I think we've spent about 10 per cent of our GDP in helping people get through this, in he helping people get through this uh, crisis. And what do Labor do? They start playing word games and semantics with numbers and make out that somehow we're reducing JobSeeker. JobSeeker is still $150 higher than what it was this time last year. In case you didn't realise, we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on keeping people going. That is unsustainable in the long term. Okay? It is wealth for toil. We have got to get people back to work. 
We can't continue to pay people to stay at home. You know, there's people out there in regional communities, employers out there in regional communities, who are crying out for labour. And what, and what does the Labor Party do? They want to keep these payments going so that we can't get the economy moving Thank again. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your Thank time you. has expired. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And what we've seen from this government and what we saw from that contribution as well is a pattern of misleading on this policy. Uh, we heard it in question time with a response from Minister Payne at the same time. Uh, the claims that they have been making about this policy have been misleading. This was exposed during Senate estimates. Uh, they still continue to claim that this program is going to create 450,000 jobs, when what we know through Senate estimates is that it's only going to uh, provide 45,000 jobs. And it's just further evidence with this government that there's the claim and the reality. Uh, they do it almost with every policy, and the Prime Minister is the worst offender, but it's followed. He's the leader, uh, and they all follow suit, uh, where they have this big claim about what this policy is going to deliver, but the reality is completely different. And it's often Australians or those struggling or bushfire-impacted communities are the ones that actually are left behind. Uh, and Labor have been responsible this year, uh, where we have uh, been productive because we know that this is a difficult year for Australians dealing with the pandemic. So we have been constructive where possible, but we've also highlighted issues that have need fixing in a constructive way. And that we were always concerned from the day this policy was announced that it has many flaws, uh, and we've highlighted those. Uh, the false numbers, so the false claims, uh, the fact that over one million Australians over 35 will not be eligible for this program. Uh, that this credit can go to firms paying big executive bonuses. And there's many loopholes, some that the unions have identified will lead to more insecure work at a time when Australians can least afford it. So as I said, that approach that Labor has been taking this year, uh, where we have been responsible and constructive, uh, and we've, put, we've been like that on all significant policies that the government have been put forward, we put forward amendments to fix these loopholes in a responsible way. And to their credit, One Nation supported one of these amendments, uh, and that was uh, aimed, at protect, aimed at protections against being sacked or having their hours reduced under the Job Making Hiring, hiring Credit Scheme. So that was the substance of the amendment that we put forward that One Nation voted for on Tuesday. Uh, so on the Tuesday, One Nation supported this, uh, and they actually put out a statement as well, uh, and they published this saying that the scheme hadn't been properly thought through and had too many flaws and that it left older job seekers overlooked and disadvantaged. So this was on the Tuesday, and by Wednesday, we know what happened, uh, One Nation had backflipped uh, and decided to support the government. So it's a disappointing effort from One Nation, but again, uh, as a Queenslander who obviously uh, follows these issues and the role that One Nation play in supporting the government closely, uh, we have come to expect it from them. They always try and find a way to justify, at the end of the day, backing in their LNP mates and the government. But I think the reasoning this time um, deserves special attention, um, because what they said is that uh, their backflip was based on government reassurances. So let's get this right. Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts spend the majority of their time going around the country undermining government saying you can't believe government, you can't trust government, you can't trust them on the Great Barrier Reef, you can't trust them on science, uh, and basically that is their message to Australians that you can't trust government. Yet here they are trying to justify in this chamber uh, their decision where they backflipped on this issue uh, is that they accepted government reassurances. Uh, it does not wash uh, and it is not good enough that One Nation uh, sought to do the right thing on Tuesday uh, and then backflipped under a bit of government pressure. Uh, but the real consequences for this, and this is so often the case with One Nation and the work that they do with government, is that it is Australians who are going to suffer from this, and particularly those who are over 35 who are struggling to get back into the workplace. Uh, so I know that there's significant unemployment through many parts of regional Queensland. Uh, my most recent trip through Harvey Bay and Bundaberg uh, reminded me of this, where uh, there is a significant proportion of that community uh, that are unemployed and are long-term unemployed as well. 
And the reality is, is that this government program, with the support of One Nation, is only going to be exploited in those communities. So where you have high unemployment, you have people who are desperately looking for work, the fact of the matter is that this, pro this project the government have put forward, this proposal the government put forward, supported by One Nation, is actually going to undermine those people who are desperately seeking work in many parts of Queensland. It is shameful on the government and it is shameful on One Nation. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Giacconi to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I move to take note of the answer to my question from Foreign Minister Payne. Um, I don't think this government, they just don't get it. They just don't get the seriousness of action required to be tackling our climate crisis. We have got an opportunity now with, Vice Pres with uh, President elect Biden with his commitment to be tackling climate change, with his um, assertion and his, his absolute realistic description of the climate crisis as the number one issue facing humanity. I think it's excellent that our Prime Minister had a conversation with President-elect Biden this morning, and it would have been a wonderful opportunity to actually talk about the opportunities of how we could be increasing our, our ambition to properly be tackling our climate crisis with the urgency required. We know that an incoming Biden government is going to be taking much more action than Trump has, has been taking, and we know that given the level of ambition that, Vice, that President elect Biden has already put on the table, that there is the opportunity for us to be actually taking some amazing steps forward in getting the level of reduction in pollution that is necessary if we, as, a, as humanity, are going to have a future on this planet. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem that the that opportunity was there in our Prime Minister's mind. And I'm not actually that surprised, given that what we know about the laggards that we have been on the world stage when it comes to climate over the last seven years. We've got more out of the report from President-elect Biden, um, from his report of the conversation, than I got out of asking my question to Minister Payne today. I mean, we were told from the report from President-elect Biden that um, they, the discussion included confronting climate change. And interestingly, as I had already noted, the report of the equivalent conversation with the Japanese Prime Minister noted their shared commitment to tackling climate change. And they call me a cynic, but the fact that we didn't get a report of the shared commitment to tackling climate change makes it sound to me as if it wasn't something that there was a sense of that shared commitment. In asking the minister the questions, Come on, what did you talk about? Let's put climate on the table. Let's make it an issue. It, we know that given that President-elect Biden says it's the number one issue facing humanity, that surely it's something worth talking about. But no, it seems that there was no discussion of the need to increase our um, ambition when it comes to targets for 2030. In fact, all that Minister Payne was able to tell me was that oh, we were talking about the long-term targets, the long-term ambition and the use of technology. Well, of course we're going to be using technology to be tackling climate change, but we need more than that. We need ambition and we need targets. And we know that President-elect Biden has already committed that under his presidency that their target will be to get their electricity emissions to zero by 2035. And we already know that even before he comes to office that the US's ambition for 2030 is much higher than the pathetic um, targets that Australia has got, because they've got the same um, commitment the uh, 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 same target for 2025 as we've got for 2030. And we know that we've got a president-elect who is committed to be increasing that target. So where does that leave Australia? And it's clear from the discussions and the reports of that discussion this morning that it leaves Australia where it has been for 
the last seven years, and that's being a complete laggard on the world stage, completely not paying attention to the importance of this issue. It leaves us there with Russia and the petro-states as being just the ones that are beholden to the fossil fuel companies, not willing to do what's necessary so that we have got a safe future. Australia is being totally left behind, and yet there is such an opportunity here. We've got the COP26 conference coming up in Glasgow next year, where Australia is going to be asked to significantly increase its ambition for 2030. We know that ev virtually every other country in the world is going to be coming to that conference with a significantly increased ambition so that we can be doing what's necessary to try and keep global heating below two degrees. But where's Australia? No willingness to commit a complete failure of public policy. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that the motion is you move to take that Senator Rice move to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator